So how do we read the Bible? I mean, in particular, when you get to one of those passages where you're reading it and you feel like, I completely understand everything that's happening. I know the names, I know the plot, I know the story, but I'm not really sure what in the world God is actually saying to me here. How then do we read the Bible? How, in particular, how do we read it so that our hearts are changed? Now personally, I have four different things I will try to do, but I'm just gonna offer one to you this morning. One way that will invite you to to read the Bible this way with me that may help you the next time. When when you're reading scripture and you're like, "I, I know what happened, but I don't know what to do with this. And it's the way of double love. I got this principle from Augustine who got it from Jesus. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus sums up the whole law of God with two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And as St. Augustine reflects on this passage, he says, if Jesus says that the whole of Scripture points to this and is held together by these two commands, then this is what we should expect to find in every passage. That if we are reading the Bible, we should expect it to lead us to love God more and to love our neighbor more. And he went so far as to say that even if you're reading the Bible and you get everything right, but if it doesn't leave you to love God and neighbor more, then you're reading it wrong. So following Augustine, following Jesus, when we hear Genesis 46 this morning, we're continuing the story of Joseph And at this point, Joseph's brothers and his fathers are heading down to Egypt. As we listen, we're going to listen to the answer to two questions. What in this passage leads us to love God more? And what in this passage leads us to love our neighbor more? And so with those questions in our ears, listen with me to the word of God. But before we do, let's pray together. Lord, speak your word so that we might hear. Dig out our ears so that we would listen and listen in faith and in faith grow in love for you and for our neighbors. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So listen closely and listen well for these are the very words of God. When Israel set out on his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's own hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones, and their wives and the wagons that Pharaoh had given to carry him. They also took their livestock and all and the goods that they had acquired in the land of Canaan and they came into Egypt. Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought with him into the land of Egypt. Now these are the names of the Israelites, Jacob and his offspring who came to Egypt. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the children of Reuben, Hanach, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The children of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohab, 
Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the uh, son of a Canaanite woman. The children of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The children of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the children of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The children of Issachar, Tola, Puva, Jashub, and Shimron. The children of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jalil. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padan Aram, together with his daughter Dinah. And all his sons and his daughters numbered 33. The children of Gad, Ziphion, Hagi, Shuni, Esbon, Ehi, Arodi, and um, Eri, Arodi, and Areli. The children of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Berea, and their sister Sarah. The children of Berea were Heber and Malkiel. These are the children of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Leah. These she bore to Jacob, 16 persons. The children of Jacob's wife, Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. To Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. The children of Benjamin, Bela, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. These are the children of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The children of Dan, Hashum. The children of Naphtali, Jazil, Guni, Jezer, and Shillam. These are the children of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to his daughter, Rachel. These she bore to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons who belonged to Jacob, who came with him in, into Egypt, who were his own offspring, not including the wives of his sons, were 66 persons in all. The children of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two, all the persons of the house of Jacob who came with him into Egypt were 70. Then Israel sent Judah ahead to Joseph to lead the way before him into Goshen. When they came to the land of Goshen, Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet his father Israel in Goshen. He presented himself to him, fell upon his neck and wept upon his neck a long, a good while. Then Israel said to Joseph, I can die now having seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds for they have been keepers of livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, we and our ancestors, so that you may settle in the land of Goshen because all shepherds are abhorrent to the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So perhaps that question is rumbling in your head. Maybe you're like, I, I kind of understand what happened but what in the world is God saying to us here? I mean, because the plot line is fairly clear. Jacob heads to Egypt. God appears to him in a vision along the way. And Jacob brings his whole family down with him. And Jacob and Joseph reunite. And because they're shepherds, the family settles in the land of Goshen. Great. The facts are clear, but what does this have to do with us? 
So following Augustine, who's following Jesus, we're going to let the two great commandments of scripture cause us to listen to this passage to answer two questions. What in this passage leads us to love God more? And what in this passage leads us to love our neighbor more? So let's answer each of those questions in turn and see where God brings us. Our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And so what in this passage leads us to love God more? And there are at least two things. The first is in verse four, where God says, I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again and Joseph's own hand shall close your eyes. Wherever we go, God goes with us. The promise comes to Jacob in a vision at Beersheba. This is the the first time in our whole walk through the story of Joseph that God speaks directly and he speaks here in a vision of the night to Jacob and he promises to go with Jacob to Egypt and to bring him up again. Wherever we go, God goes with us. Every time Jacob crosses the boundaries of the promised land, when he goes out or he goes in, God appears to him and promises to be with him and to be his God. So when Jacob fled his brother Esau's wrath and would end up spending 20 years in the house of Laban, when he crossed out of the promised land, God appeared to him and said, I will be with you. And when he finally got free and he came back and he was fearing that maybe Esau was going to kill him still 20 years later, when he gets to the border, God appears to him. He says, I will go with you. I will be your God. And now here one last time as Jacob crosses the boundary out of the promised land to go down to Egypt, God appears to him and says, I myself will go down with you and I will bring you up again. And this time Jacob will die there. He will not, this side of the grave, make it back to the promised land. It will be hundreds of years, generations, before God will bring Israel's children up again. Yet all this while God will be with them. God's promise to be with Jacob covered the good times and the bad. It covered when God blessed him in the house of Laban and when he was oppressed in the house of Laban. It covered when he was running away from Esau and when, surprise of surprises, Esau embraced him. The good and the bad, wherever Jacob went, God was with him. And the same promise that God spoke to Jacob, Jesus speaks to us. It's in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wherever we go, God goes with us. And like with Jacob, this covers the good times and the bad. When we head down, when we have our life enter the pit, when we enter our own personal Egypts, God goes with us. Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And when we are brought up again, when we are lifted out of sorrow and mourning, when our cries are answered and we rejoice again, that too is of the hand of God. For God promised, I will also bring you up again. So what in this passage leads us to love God more? Wherever we go, God goes with us. So that's the first place. Wherever we go, God goes with us. And the second is in verses eight to 27. So that's that really long genealogy with 70 names in it. I'm not gonna repeat it again for you all. But what in the passage leads us to love God more? And we see this in this genealogy that God cares about individuals and about families. God is at work redeeming individuals but also redeeming families. This is the last genealogy in the book of Genesis and a book full of genealogies. Yet this isn't exactly where we would have expected it. Genesis 36 has this whole long genealogy of Esau and then Genesis 37 begins with this is the story of the sons of Jacob 
And if everything followed as it would, we would expect to have all the list of all the children right here. But instead, we have this 20-year saga that we've been following along with where the brothers hate Joseph. They throw him in the pit. They sell him and tear their family apart. And 20 years later, God knits the family back together. They reconcile and God brings that family back together. Because only then, only once the family is knit together, then do we get the list of all the children. And all these children have already been born by this point. But we only get it at the end because God cares about the family being brought together. God cares about re-knitting broken families. So it's only when the family's whole again that we hear about the coming generation because God cares about redeeming individuals, but he also cares about redeeming families. And there are 70 names in these 19 verses. And these are concrete individuals with their own stories and their own struggles, but they're also a family. And God's promises, his redemption, his salvation plan in this world is both for individuals and for families. Because God is concerned about Imna and Ishva and Ishvi and the whole family of Israel. And this is not something we just see here. The the double concern for families and for individuals is all throughout scripture. God calls Abraham the individual and then promises to give him a family. God rescues the whole family of Israel from Egypt, the descendants of those who went down in our passage today through the individuals of Moses and Aaron. And God calls individuals to faith and trust in him and yet they were called to circumcise their children, to raise them up to know and love the Lord. And when Jesus called his disciples, he called them one by one and yet called them into the family of God and called Christians to raise up children in the faith, marking them with the waters and promises of baptism so they too would confess faith in Christ. Later this morning, we will see a vivid example of just what it means that God cares for individuals and for families. We're gonna see Joanna Valinga make her public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And 17 years ago, her parents brought her to the font to be baptized and heard the promises of God spoken over her to forgive her sins, to adopt her into the body of Christ the church, to send the Holy Spirit daily to renew and cleanse her and to resurrect her to eternal life. And in some ways, Joanna standing up before us is God keeping his promises that he made to this family all those years ago. A baptized child of the faith standing up and proclaiming faith in Jesus Christ shows that God cares about families. Yet Joanna will also stand up there as an individual, as one who has herself heard the gospel and responded in faith. She will stand as one who believes not just because it was taught to her or it's what her family believes, but because she herself believes in Jesus Christ. And so when a baptized child of the faith stands up and proclaims faith in Jesus Christ, it's also saying that God cares about individuals. That she matters to God, that you matter to God, all people matter to God, not because just of what family they were born into or what advantages or disadvantages they had, but because of the good news of the gospel. That Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. And part of the beauty and the power of this genealogy here in Genesis 46 is seeing that there are a whole family here and yet each of them is named. There are a lot of names, 70 of them. And most of them we know nothing about other than that they are here. Yet the Holy Spirit considered each and every one of them important enough that they would be included in the Bible. We know nothing about Mupim, Hupim, and Ard. But God does. It was his will that their names be included here. That when the roll call of the family of God is called, they would be included. And we know nothing about Ari, Arodi, and Areli. But God does. So each individual named in this genealogy is a life that matters to God. Even if we know nothing about it. So if you feel insignificant, 
Like you're nothing but a name on a page. Like you're swallowed up by your family or lost in the shuffle. God knows you, even if no one else does. God knows your name and your story just as he knows Jemuel, Jamin, Ohab, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul. So in the inclusion of this genealogy, we see God's passion for families and his passion for each and every individual that he knows by name. So what should lead us to love God more in this passage? God's care for families and God's care for individuals. So that's our first question. What leads us to love God more? We saw that God will go with us wherever we go when we go down When we are brought up, God goes with us. Just as he was with Jacob, Jesus promises that he'll be with us always. And then we see in this long list of names, God's care for the family of Israel, the family of God for families. And yet God's care for each and every named individual. So God cares for families, even yours, and for individuals, even you. But what about our second question? What in this passage leads us to love our neighbor more? I'll admit this is a little bit harder to see in this passage, but there are at least two places. The first is there again in the genealogy. God loves individuals and families. He is passionate about it. We see this throughout the Bible, but it's highlighted here in this catalog of names. So if God is so concerned about families and individuals, then we should be too. If God worked 20 years to take what these brothers had ripped apart in this family in order to knit it back together, then Christians should be concerned to strengthen, heal, and knit together families. If God cares about the broken family of Jacob, about the hatred, the lies, and the guilt that threatened to bury them, then we as followers of Christ should care for the broken families in our communities, for the hatred, lies, and guilt that threatened to bury them as well. God cares about individuals and about families, and if God is so concerned, so we should be too. And if God cares about the forgotten names and lives of Ziphion, Hagi, and Shuni, then we should care for the nameless and forgotten in our community, those who feel unloved and uncared for as individuals. This invitation is then learn the names of your neighbors, learn their stories, Just last week, I was sitting out for outdoor outdoor office hours, and one girl from the community was just biking around in circles in our parking lot. She stopped to ask me what I was reading. And so I told her what what book I was reading, because if I'm sitting out there and you aren't visiting, that's kind of what I'm doing. And then she started to tell me her story. How excited, she, how, she, how long she'd been in foster care and how excited she was to, to see her father and spend a night with him for the first time in 18 months. I don't know her name. I didn't get it yet. But I know her story and every time I'm out there I see her because she's biking by and I pray for her. I don't know her name but God knows her. So that's the first place our passage leads us to love our neighbor more. God's concern for families and individuals should lead us to do the same. And then the second thing is found right at the end. Verses 31 through 34 is that one of the ways that we love our neighbor is to be distinct as the people of God. The people of Israel are shepherds. And though God wants them to come to Egypt to be fed and settled, they're not to hide their calling to hide their unique calling and occupation. Instead, they're to be upfront about it. Joseph says, when Pharaoh asks, tell him you are shepherds. And then we get at the end, you'll settle in Goshen because all shepherds are abhorrent to the Egyptians. So even though being who God had made them to be, being who God had called them to be, being shepherds was going to be abhorrent to the world, abhorrent to the Egyptians, they were to be upfront. They were to be honest. They were to be distinct. And I don't know whether Joseph planned this or whether it was divine providence, but the fact that they were upfront about being shepherds meant that the people of Israel lived in Egypt but not among the Egyptians. They lived 
in the land of Egypt, but they never became one of them. They were separate and distinct even as they lived in the land of Egypt. And that witness of their lives that started because they were shepherds but lived because they were distinct people of God made a difference centuries later when they left Egypt. Yes, the Pharaoh and the powers of Egypt hated them, but many of the Egyptians went with them. They wanted to be part of the people of God as they left Egypt. One of the ways we love our neighbors is to be distinct as the people of God. We are shepherds. We have been called to a different way than the way of the world. We've been called to follow Jesus, to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek, to forgive 70 times seven, to root out lust, not to worship money. We've been called to live differently. And like the sons of Israel, that will mean living in Egypt but never belonging to Egypt. Living in the world but never belonging to it. Yet living for Christ, even if it is abhorrent to the world, is one of the best ways we love our neighbors. So how do we read the Bible? What do we do when we get all the facts straight and we, we understand just what happened yet wondered, what is God saying to us here? I offered you one way of listening to scripture so that even when we're in a genealogy in Genesis 46, we can begin to hear what God has to say to us, to you today. It's the way of double love, to listen for how is God leading me through this passage to love him more? And how is God leading me to love my neighbor more? And the question for each of us in light of that is were we listening? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please pray with me. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the parts that are clear and the application obvious. And we thank you for the parts where, that force us to wrestle with your word and to ask difficult questions. We thank you that when we look at your word and seek to love you more and love our neighbor more, your word never returns empty. And so as we see your care for families and individuals, as we hear that you go with us, we pray that you would lead us to love you and to love individuals and to love families, to work for the strengthening of the forgotten and the knitting together of families and that we would then still live as distinct people following Jesus in this world. We pray all this in the beautiful name of Jesus, amen.